Every year, a handful of people are honored by their selection as Nobel Prize recipients in several areas of human endeavor. In 1973, the Nobel Prize in Physics was shared by these three men. By what paths does a man travel to receive such an award? On most mornings, you can find this man jogging near his Schenectady, New York home before going to work at a research laboratory nearby. His name is Ivor Gaver. This is the story of some of his research and of his prize-winning discovery. It has inspired others to make further discoveries. This purely scientific inquiry has greatly enhanced our understanding of metals in ways that may someday revolutionize the electronics industry. Who's that? Who's what? The little picture. Have you seen this house here? This is, I moved there when I was six years old. And basically I grew up on that farm. And this was taken at the Technical Institute. When I was young, that was the day where that was, that we were engaged at that time, remember That's that? right. I was hoping you would remember. Of course I remember, why wouldn't <laughs> I remember? And that was before I went in the army and I was not a very good student, unfortunately. What would you say about that? Yes, uh, that, I think that's true. Even though I yell at you. didn't study very hard. Even though I yell at you, Trina, and say you ought to be a good student, because now I know how important it was. I didn't know it then, so I was too dumb. Well, look where you are now. You were a bad student. Okay, that's means that hope for you or what? <laughs> yeah, Trina, as you remember, or as I probably told you before, when uh, Mommy and I came to uh, Canada, your brother was only a year old. And the reason we left, as you remember, was because we couldn't get an apartment in Norway, but just no place you can get any, any place to live. It was easy to get a job, but very, very difficult to get a place to live. So finally, we, we packed up and we left and we went to Toronto. And we were fortunate to get a job at the General Electric Company. And actually one reason I got a job was that my grades in Norway were so bad, I got 4-0, which was the worst grade you could get in Norway, but in the United States, as you know, 4-0 is the best grade you can get. So in my interview, the guy looked at my papers and said, you see, your grades are pretty good, and I didn't want to correct them. I just got myself a job. I was very happy about that. And uh, then we stayed in Canada for about a year and a half, and we had a really lovely time. But we found out that I took a training course in Canada, and there was more opportunities in Schenectady. And uh, I was much impressed by the people I met up there, and I saw what they did, and they could let their curiosity take over, and they could search out what they think would be important. Well, Ivor Gaver was on a temporary assignment at the General Electric Research Laboratory. He came to me one day and asked for a job as a physicist. I had met him only once before then, but I quite frankly was impressed with him, how well he explained his work and how well he understood it. So I told him to give me a few days and I would uh, give him an answer. I went back to the people that he was working with on temporary assignment and asked them about him. And they gave him absolutely outstanding recommendations, said he was a top individual. So I uh, offered him a job working with our group. And at that time, John Fisher had wanted to undertake a new line of research in thin films. John Fisher had the idea that he might be able to reproduce many of the phenomena on which semiconductor devices were based using thin films of metals and uh, insulators. Now, John was perhaps the most outstanding uh, teacher and inspiring individual we had in our group, and it seemed to me that assigning Gaver, a young person trying to learn physics, to Fisher was the best possible combination. So that's the reason that I put uh, Gaver to work with Fisher in this new line of research. When uh, John Fisher hired me, he uh, said I should work on thin films. And of course, to me at that time, film was something you put on a camera. 
So I went to the library and I borrowed a book about uh, the photographic process. It's similar to this book here, actually. And, uh, but of course, that was not what John Fisher had in mind at all, which showed you that I had a lot to learn at that time. Well, actually, I, I wasn't sure what kind of films we were going to be using either, it turns out. Uh, the films that we started out with were Langmuir films. Irving Langmuir, who worked there, and I talked to, uh, had worked out a technique to put very thin films down on the surface of water. They were molecules like soap molecules that uh, would form a monolayer on the water and uh, didn't work at all. So that's when we discovered we had to go to stronger films and went to oxide films on metals. They were plenty strong. A piece of metal contains very many small particles, free to move around inside the piece. But they can't readily get out at the surface. The surface is a barrier. These particles are electrons. They are electrically charged. They're the ones that carry the electrical current in the wires we use. But bring a second piece of metal close to the surface of the first one, and they will jump across. The closer they get, the more will jump across. This happens even though the space between the two metals presents a barrier to the electrons. When they jump across the barrier, we say they're tunneling. If one attempts to prove this in the laboratory by experiment, one has to make sure that the two pieces don't touch. So to hold the two metals apart, what is needed is a very thin non-metallic film, one which would not normally conduct electrons an electrically insulating film. This is the kind of thin film that Dr. Fisher wanted Ivor to make. Fisher felt that such a metal to film to metal junction might prove useful as an electronics device. Tunneling is a quantum mechanical effect and very baffling to us in terms of our experience with ordinary objects, such as tennis balls. It puzzled Ivor too when he was told about it. In the tunnel effect, the ball can pass through the racket undamaged, even though it doesn't have the energy to break the strings. That's what quantum mechanics predicts can happen. Although for the tennis ball at least, the probability for it is so extremely small that it has never been observed. But in principle, it is possible. Oh, where do they bounce? Now, electrons, are really a little bit like this tennis ball here, except they're much smaller. Now, if you play tennis, it is possible for a tennis ball to go through a racket. And uh, that might be an excuse you can use for your partner next time you play tennis. But if you play with me, I would never believe it, because uh, I know too much about quantum mechanics now. And uh, a tennis ball is really much too big. But electrons are very small, and they behave according to what is called quantum mechanics. And uh, Dr. John Fisher got me to go back to school and learn quantum mechanics at RPI. And if a person is ignorant of a particular subject, but bright and energetic and starts working in it, then he can make real progress. And this was the sort of thing that happened to Ivor. He was, he was ignorant of the field that he was working in, but he was very bright, highly motivated. And uh, because of his, he didn't understand it too well, he wasn't caught in all of the old ruts that everybody else was caught in. Because there's, if, if, if you got all the pieces of, a, of, of things put in your head the wrong way, the same way everybody else does, that's a trap. It's very difficult to get out of. Well, I wasn't in that. Uh, he, didn't, he could take all the pieces of the puzzle, put them in his brain in a different way. And uh, when you do that and you're bright about it and you're lucky about it and you work at it, you can make new breakthroughs. And uh, that's what we talked about, and that's what I told him. That was uh, really good advice John gave me, and I probably didn't recognize that at the time. But it's quite true that uh, if you want to do good research, it's important not to know too much. This almost seems contradictory, but really, if you know too much, then you, and you get an idea, you will sort of talk yourself out of trying it because you figure it won't work. But if you know just the right amount, then you get enthusiastic about your project, you go ahead, you do it, and if you're lucky, things work out.
Both John Fisher and Ivor Gaber suggest the possibility that the gifted beginner has a better chance to come up with new ideas. In any event, at that point, Ivor decided he needed to learn about quantum mechanics. But there you have built And so he took some courses at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. But while taking the courses, he continued his work at General Electric under Dr. Fisher. It wasn't very long before Ivor hit upon a way to make a junction of two layers of metal separated by a thin insulating film. He obtained a vacuum evaporator, a device which is used for plating materials with layers of metal. There is a high vacuum under the bell jar and in the evacuated space, some metal in a heating dish. As the metal in the dish gets hotter and hotter, it will boil away. The metal vapor settles as a layer of solid metal on everything that's cooler even the inside of the bell jar. Then the heating of the dish is stopped. Air is restored back into the evacuated space. And so the evaporator produces the metal strip Ivor needed on a glass slide. But now, with the metal strip restored to air, a chemical reaction combines the oxygen in the air with metal on the surface of the strip. This forms a thin, transparent layer, and this layer is an insulator. The insulating film is already attached to the metal. So now all he had to do was to return the glass slide back into the vacuum evaporator and lay down a second metal strip crosswise. For economy, Ivor produced a series of five strip crosses on each glass slide. If Dr. Fisher's ideas were correct, Electrons should be tunneling through the insulating layers at each cross point right now. To test this, he applied the voltage from a battery connecting the positive terminal with one metal strip and the negative terminal to the metal strip crossing it. Now more of the electrons should tunnel in one direction than the other. The greater the battery voltage, the more electrons should tunnel from left to right, and the greater the current should be. Here he's getting ready to make a recording of the current as he increases the voltage. The current varies in direct proportion to the voltage. Ivor's colleagues were, on the whole, quite skeptical about whether he had found tunneling with his device. One of their objections was that the thin film might not be a perfect insulator, but might act as a conductor, although a very poor one. To be more precise, it might act as a semiconductor. And so Ivor had to check on this, and he found that they were partly right. A semiconductor is highly sensitive to temperature. The colder it is, the more it turns into an insulator. And this effect is quite dramatic, especially if you use a very cold bath like this one, liquid nitrogen. Its temperature is about 200 degrees below zero Celsius. As you will see, there is less current through the junction at this low temperature, but the reduction of current is much smaller than one would have expected if the semiconduction mechanism were the only one operating. There is another mechanism operating here. It is quantum mechanical tunneling. To make a long story short, tunneling is the dominant mechanism at low temperature. And so, Ivor had his tunnel effect, just as John Fisher had ordered. I uh, really don't remember anymore, but it's uh, possible at that time that somebody suggested I do the experiment at an even much lower temperature. It's a strange thing happened to metal at low temperatures they become superconducting. And there was quite some interest in superconductivity by people around me at that time. But if they did suggest it, I would have rejected the suggestion. Because in my mind, tunneling only depends upon the barrier, and by changing the temperature, the barrier would not change, and therefore there should be no effect. 
Fortunately for me, I was taking classes over at RPI at that time, and uh, I took a class by Hill Huntington in solid state physics, and he reviewed superconductivity. And in his class, I got a terrific idea. He uh, was a member of my class uh, about that time. We had a two-semester course in solid state physics. Long well, about the middle of the spring semester, we were studying superconductivity. Now, superconductivity is a very interesting phenomenon and characterizes a large number of metals and uh, alloys. Uh, it's been found that as the temperature drops uh, with these materials, there comes a certain critical temperature, only a few degrees above absolute zero, where the electrical resistivity of the material drops with amazing suddenness. Now, uh, it's a very puzzling phenomenon, and there have been a great many theories put forward on this in past time. But just a couple of years before the time that we we're discussing, there had come out a new theory called the BCS theory, which postulated that there was a strong interaction between the charge-carrying quantities in the metal, the so-called electrons, that these were indeed paired together in a particular way when the superconducting transition took place. What Dr. Huntington is telling us here has to do with the electrons in the metal. The ones Ivor found could tunnel through barriers of oxide film. As the metal is cooled to within a few degrees above absolute zero temperature, the electrons suddenly pair off, as it were, turning the metal into a superconductor. Now the electrons hold on to each other. It would take work to pull them apart. What this means, by the magic of quantum mechanics, is that a gap exists in the energy levels allowed for the electrons in the superconducting metal, the superconducting energy gap. At the time Dr. Huntington was explaining this in Ivor's class, there had not yet been very convincing and direct proof of the energy gap by laboratory experiment. Ivor came to me and said he wanted to drop the course. I was a bit surprised because he'd been an excellent student. So I said to him as much, uh, how come? And he said, well, I'm into something really very exciting at this point, and uh, the laboratory wants me to give it full time. In due course, I think I uh, gave him an incomplete, yes, indeed. Now, this uh, diagram up here represents the tunnel junction. You have a metal and another metal which are separated by a very thin barrier. In the two metals, you have electrons, which are moving about all the time. And now, if you apply a little voltage, so one metal become negative and the other metal become positive, what will happen is that these electrons can go across the barrier and tunnel from left to right. And so we get a current which flows here. And we have shown you before, you have a diagram where you have current on one axis and voltage on the other axis. As soon as you start applying a voltage, the current will increase, and basically what you get is that current and voltage has a linear relationship, as we showed before. Now a very curious thing happened if you make the metal superconducting. The theory of Bardeen, Cooper, and Schieffer says the electrons will pair up. So put in very simple terms, there will be a pairwise, pairwise force between the electrons. And they can represent that with these bars, like so. And when you have that pairwise force, it takes energy to split the bond between the electrons, and they really can tunnel at low voltage. And the end result is that when we deal with a low voltage, we have no current at all. And we reach a certain voltage where you can su put sufficient energy to break these bonds. And when you get to that particular point, then electrons again will start tunneling across, and you get a current voltage characteristic like this. And this voltage here is the measure of what people in superconductivity call the energy gap. I got this idea. His colleagues had earlier proposed that he try his junction at a very low temperature, and Ivor had rejected the suggestions. Now he was convinced that the transition to superconductivity would make a difference. But his colleagues were not so sure. When Ivor had the idea of tunneling 
through superconductors so we could see the energy gap. Uh, it, I, I was sort of negative about it. It didn't seem like a good idea to me. I didn't expect that the gap would actually show up in the experiments. It didn't, I didn't think he'd be able to see it. But uh, he wanted to do it, and I said, OK, go ahead and do it uh, and see what happens. This is a simplified version of the type of experiment he actually performed. A junction slide and some liquid helium have been placed into the innermost of a pair of nesting vacuum bottles. The space between the inner and outer vacuum bottles contains liquid nitrogen. Its function is to provide cooling and insulation from the temperature of the room. The junction lies suspended above the level of the liquid helium, but within the insulating jacket of liquid nitrogen. As we apply increasing voltage across the junction from the battery, the tunneling current increases in proportion with the voltage. The graph is a straight line, just as Ivor showed us earlier at higher temperatures in air and in liquid nitrogen. This is because the junction is still at considerably higher temperature than the liquid helium. The metal in the junction is not yet superconducting. But now, let us repeat the procedure with the junction submerged in the liquid helium. The liquid helium is at 269 degrees below zero Celsius, about four degrees above the absolute zero of temperature. Now the metal in the junction is superconducting. For emphasis, the XY recorder retraces the line. And here we see the effect. Fewer electrons are tunneling. In fact, very few electrons seem to be tunneling at first at the lower values of the voltage because most of them are still bound. Ivor found that at lower temperatures, even closer to the absolute zero of temperature, practically no electrons will tunnel up to a given voltage, which is a measure of the gap. The curve, like this one, which he drew for us on the blackboard earlier, is for the limiting case of absolute zero. His idea was right, and he had proved it by experiment. Lo and behold, there, there was the energy gap. You could see it in the experiment. It was just beautiful. And uh, so I told him, Ivor, you, this was your idea. You did it uh, all on your own, so go ahead and publish it on your own. And uh, you're a physicist. It was exciting for me to be involved in this, if only remotely. The superconducting tunneling experiments are extremely important in the development of understanding this phenomenon. For the first time, people were able to really see the effect of the superconducting gap in a way which was far more convincing than anything that uh, had gone before. It also turns out that the experiment verifies in a very convincing way the bardeen cooper schrieffer so-called BCS theory, and this has been a tremendous advance for the whole field. Sometimes when we did this experiment, something very curious happened. And that particularly happened if we used barriers which were very, very thin. Then when we looked at the current versus voltage, rather than seeing the curve like that, we got current right away. Current came up, and at the particular point, it normally flipped over, and then it followed the old curve. And uh, we couldn't really understand that, but uh, after we thought about it, we were absolutely certain what would happen, since the barrier were so thin that we really had metallic short. We weren't able to separate the two metals, and therefore there was a little short metallic bridge across, and then these pairwise electrons can easily flow across the bridge. So essentially, we said this is an artifact, this current we see here, so, and what later turned out to be a very interesting effect, when we had samples showing this effect, we simply just threw them away and saying it was an artifact. A little later, a young graduate student named Brian Josephson, a theoretician working in England, predicted that even the bound electron pairs should tunnel. Josephson wasn't concerned with practical laboratory problems when he came up with this idea, and so questions of short circuits were far from his mind. General Electric's Research and Development Center devotes a fraction of its effort to areas of scientific research where our staff members have good ideas, even if the immediate commercial impact isn't obvious to us. Now, in the case of 
Ivers' work, it's had tremendous impact scientifically and has advanced our knowledge of superconductivity tremendously. But as of today, it has not had any significant commercial impact in the form of products or new processes. Nevertheless, we are always quite proud when outstanding scientific work of our staff members brings them wide recognition and honor in scientific circles. It is, of course, always uh, delightful to get a price in uh, science and that, that this work is recognized by people at large. And in particular, the first day is a lot of a hoopla and you get telephone calls and telegrams from people all over the world, people which you have forgotten that you even knew. And uh, in many ways, it's a little bit embarrassing as well because I think people in science recognize that to get an important award, sometimes all you need is to hit one home run. And most scientists, of course, are not that lucky. In a series of brilliant experiments and calculations, you have explored different aspects of tunneling phenomena in solids. On behalf of the Royal Academy of Sciences, I wish to express our admiration and convey to you our warmest congratulations. I now ask you to proceed to receive your prizes from the hands of His Majesty the King. So when I got the prize, I thought that I should say something to the king. And uh, so when I shook hand, I said to him in Swedish, it was very nice to meet him in this particular manner. And he was sort of taken aback because he hadn't expected me to speak to him in Swedish. But he must have been clued in because he then said that, uh, I understand I can speak Swedish with you. shared the prize with uh, Leo Isaki, who was oldest and therefore received the prize first, and Brian Josephson, who was youngest and therefore received the prize at last. I'm not what you would call a scholar, where you like to study and you like to learn more and more about things. I'm more intuitive, and I really enjoy going into the laboratory and work. And I tend to take intuitive approaches to my work. And uh, if then I can find something very interesting, I later go back and maybe do the calculations necessary. A few years before I received the Nobel Prize for Physics, I really had changed my field. And uh, I've been trying to become a biophysicist or a biologist. And what occupies me now is to study protein layers on surfaces and this has led me into the field of immunology, and uh, I've had a lot of fun doing that, and uh, I don't know what I'll do in the future, I really don't know.